will be RNA synthesis and regulation. The first thing we're going to do is remind ourselves how DNA was replicated and then see how RNA synthesis compares and contrasts to that. So to remind you, let's look at DNA replication one more time. What was needed to make a copy of a piece of DNA? Well, the obvious answer is to start with, you need a piece of DNA in order to copy it. So this requires an existing DNA template. Okay, the next thing we need is since the DNA polymerase cannot start de novo, or can't start from scratch, it needs some kind of primer to be put on. Now this primer could be in the form of a little small piece of DNA that hybridizes, and we do that in the lab with, with ordered oligos or primers. But in nature, it doesn't order them from a company and be sent to the cell. What happens is a small piece of RNA is put on by an RNA polymerase, which does not require a primer, because if it did, we'd have an endless series of questions as who put on your primer. So an RNA polymerase called primase puts on a little piece, and then the DNA polymerase can take over. We covered that in the last lecture. The other material we need to do this are the four raw materials, the DATPs, the DGTPs, DTTPs, DCTPs, right? We need those bound to magnesium to be raw materials for adding to this growing chain. And of course, we need the polymerase itself. And so again, a reminder at the top is the growing strand is being made on the top row, and it's growing in the 5 to 3 direction. The strand underneath it is being read 3 to 5 as the template, and the open 3' prime hydroxy you see at the end of the growing strand attacks the primary or the, the incoming piece at the alpha phosphate and it makes a new phosphodiester bond. And this continues until we run out of template or we're told to stop for some reason. Okay. Let's compare this to the way we do this quickly in a lab setting. So the first thing the cell would need to do here is pull apart the existing double helix. And we know we had topoisomerases we had helicases, we had the single-stranded binding proteins as a reminder, all that work to get them apart. Well, in the lab, we would do it in a much simpler way. We just heat up the solution to near boiling and the strands would come apart. That's not amenable to do inside of a living cell, but it is great to do in a test tube. Okay? The cell will use this to copy its entire genome or entire piece of linear DNA or circular DNA exactly once. It'll make one copy from the original. So when I'm done, I have two copies of the original. And it does it in that semi-conservative fashion we talked about last time. In the lab, though, in in vitro setting for PCR, if you heard of polymerase chain reaction, we use almost the same parts. We have the same four raw materials bound to magnesium. We have a template. This time, we don't have an RNA polymerase called primase coming along. We don't need helicases. We don't need single-stranded binding proteins. We just buy a little short piece of DNA, and we can tailor that piece to bind to any particular piece we're interested in, so it can't be just one or two bases long. It needs to be something on the order of 10, 20, 30 bases long. It'll find a piece that it hybridizes to very well, and then the DNA polymerase sees it as a piece to continue, to, to build onto, so we don't need a different priming event. Okay? The difference here is we have to do this by keep heating it up to 95 degrees every few minutes to start a new round. So we're going to copy this many, many, many times, not just once. So ideally, our polymerase should survive the heating and cooling process. And there are polymerases from heat-stable uh, or thermophilic organisms that have heat-stable polymerases, and that's the ones that we generally use. And this will make billions upon billions of copies of the original DNA piece. Right, so here's a little diagram showing how that PCR works. We start at the top with a double-stranded piece. We heat it up to 94, 95 degrees or so, and the two strands come apart. And if we cool that down, the strands would come back together. However, in place of having the strands come back together, we have an enormous number of these little oligos, these little primer pieces of DNA present. So if for every original strand of DNA, the double helix long strand you see there, there are roughly two to three billion copies of the small pieces. So it's a matter of who's going to find it first. It's a numbers game. For instance, if I asked everyone to stand up out of their seats in a classroom and leave, and then cool the classroom back down because it's comfortable again, and everybody go get your seat again, that could happen. But at the same time, I release 
six billion sand particles into the room, you're not going to get your seed back, right? There's going to be sand in it, right? So it's very unlikely the two strands will come back together. The primer is going to find its place first, the little oligo, the little piece of DNA. So we call that the annealing step. We cool it down to somewhere between 55, 50, 60, 65 degrees, somewhere in there. So much cooler than 94. And the strands will bind to the template in the place where they match the best. And then we cool it or heat it, depending on the polymerase, to its optimum temperature. In the drawing here, it's 72 degrees. It's often 68, 69, could be 70, generally around 70 degrees. And then the DNA polymerase will extend those primers because it has a piece to build on. And it's always building it in the five prime to three prime direction. It's reading the template in the three to five direction. And we copy both strands this way. After a few minutes of doing that, depending on the length, we heat it up to 95 degrees again. And everything comes back apart and we repeat, repeat the cycle. So every time I repeat this cycle, I get a doubling of the number of products. So after the first round, there are two copies from every original. After the second round, there's now eight copies, or sorry, four copies, and then eight copies, and then 16, and then 32, 64, and so forth. It's powers of two. So if I take an ideal situation where there's only one original template double strand there, a double helical strand, and I do 36 copies, or 36 rounds of this thing, I'll have two to the 36th copies when I'm done, which is around 68 billion copies. So why not do more? Why not do 40 cycles, 50 cycles, 100 cycles? Every time I do a new round, I double my output. So why stop at any one point when if you do one more round, I double what I get? And along the same lines, when you're doing these type of reactions, and the PCR cycler, the thermal cycling machine, says, hey, you've done 34 of 35 cycles. That's got to be good enough, and the power goes out. Or you stop it early for whatever reason. Is 34 out of 35 cycles good enough? Well, no, you're only getting half the material you would get if you had completed the 35th cycle. Same thing, if you only do 33 out of 35 cycles, you're only going to get a quarter of the material. So it matters to do the last cycle. Why can't we do 40, 50, or 100 then? You have to think about our raw materials. Every time I add a round or add a cycle, I'm going to use as many DNTPs, the raw materials, in that one round as I've used in all the previous rounds combined. Right? So round five, or cycle five, uses as much raw material as rounds one through four combined. Right? And same thing for round 35. It uses as much as rounds one through 34 combined. So the necessary raw materials you need, also the demand doubles every round. So of course, when you get to 36 or so, 37, maybe up to 40, you're going to start to run out of DNTPs. So of course, we're thinking, why not add more? Well, you can. You can add more, but that's going to necessitate adding more magnesium. And at some point, it gets so dense in the solution that it would just precipitate, or the excess magnesium will cause the enzyme to be inhibited. So we run into some problems if we try to do too much. So what if you need more? Well, then you just do what's at the top right of the screen. We set up a whole array of, say, eight tubes, and we do that in each one of them. We do 35, 36 rounds. And if you need more after that, you can take a small sample of each of those tubes as the beginning material in a new reaction. So we can propagate this indefinitely. This is why we can take a very small amount of genetic material from, say, a, a crime scene, if you're talking about forensics, or uh, from a, an ancient woolly mammoth, if you're trying to figure out its DNA, and amplify it over and over and over and never use up our entire original sample. So that's kind of beneficial. The danger in doing that is you may introduce mutations. So it's unlikely if you have a high fidelity polymerase, but there's always the chance. Okay, so moving on past DNA, let's compare that to RNA synthesis. So RNA is made virtually the same way as DNA, except of course our raw material is slightly different. We don't use a deoxyribose, we have a regular ribose with the 2 prime hydroxy. And we also have a subset of bases that's slightly different. We have U's in place of T's, right? whereas the G's, the A's, and the C's are all the same on a ribose this time. So to remind you of the, the picture we're looking at here in our central dogma, uh, DNA can replicate itself. That's the circular or curving arrow on the left. And then we have DNA being made into RNA. That's transcription here in red. That's what we're going to talk about next. 
We also mentioned we had reverse transcription going backwards, and we have RNA being turned into protein. That's translation, which we'll get to at the end of this block. So let's talk about the transcription today. We're going to make RNA, and of course it needs a DNA template, much like replication did. The enzyme that does this is called RNA polymerase, much like DNA polymerase, except we're going to be synthesizing an RNA polymer, both of which will still use a DNA polymer as the template. The only exception to that here is when we do reverse transcription. There we're going to be making DNA and using RNA as the template. Okay? We're not going to cover that enzyme too much, but you see it's essentially the reverse or reciprocal process. Okay, so how does this work? Let's see, what do we need to make RNA? It's much like what we just needed to make DNA. We're going to need some kind of template, right? And in most cases, this will be a piece of DNA. And most DNA you're going to find in the cell will be double-stranded. So the first thing we need to do again is pull the strands apart. Okay? However, we don't need a helicase to do this. Right? So unlike DNA polymerase, the RNA polymerase has a built-in helicase feature. Right? DNA polymerase is kind of a handicapped enzyme. It doesn't, it doesn't do a lot of its own. It needs a lot of helper molecules, like the helicases and the toporosomerases and the single-stranded binding proteins and so forth. Whereas RNA polymerase only needs to be told where to start. It doesn't need a primer. It doesn't need any help. It will do it all on its own. So I call it the do-it-all machine. It doesn't need a primer. It doesn't need helicases to help it. It doesn't need any of those things that the DNA polymerase needed. However, it must get instructions. It needs a template, of course. It needs to know what to put on. Now, yes, there are RNA polymerases that do not need templates, and we'll talk about a couple of those later. But for the most part, we're talking about the ones that do here, the ones that are making very long RNA products. Okay, we still need our activated precursors, our NTPs this time, not DNTPs. We're going to use regular ribonucleotides. Right? And then, of course, we need our magnesium or manganese or some divalent cation to, to facilitate this process because we're putting a negatively charged thing next to another negatively charged thing, and we want them to interact, so we're going to have to counter that. And so looking at a little diagram in the center there, this is the common way you see this written. The very bottom black strand is the coding strand of the DNA. We call it the coding because it's the same direction or sense as the ultimate mRNA product, or any RNA product for that matter. The other strand, the template strand, is called the antisense because it's going in the opposite direction as our RNA product. But in fact, the template or antisense strand is the one that's important. The coding strand does nothing. It just looks like a product where all the T's have been replaced with U's. It's only called that because of the way they read. They look the same. However, the template strand is the one we're actually going to use as a template. We're going to read it. Right? And so it knows what to put across from it. Okay. I know the coding strand might seem important, and it is, of course, but it isn't the one doing the work. It just happens to have the same sequence as the message, whereas the template strand or the antisense strand of the template is the one that's doing all the work. It's serving as the, the information. So how was RNA actually made? We're going to talk about three steps in the process, and this is true for a lot of processes. We have to initiate it or get it started. Once we have it started, we need to continue. And then at some point, we need to stop, right? This, this thing has to end. We need to terminate this, this molecule we're making. This long polymer doesn't go on forever. And so the RNA polymerase, to do that, is shown in the picture there. It's a prokaryotic one shown in this picture, so it's much simpler than the eukaryotic one. It's a little smaller. It's virtually the only thing that's different. And it can make any type of RNA we'd like. I said it synthesizes rRNA, tRNA, mRNA, but also all the other types of RNAs. And there's more than one RNA polymerase, just like there's more than one DNA polymerase. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Okay. So basically, let's go through the chemistry. And it's identical to the DNA synthesis. So if you look at the picture on the left, again, we have a DNA template strand there with the orange and yellow bases. And I'm reading it on the page from top to bottom, 3 prime to 5 prime. Remember, we read our template 3 to 5. And that's true for the construction of any nucleic acid. If I'm making any nucleic acid whatsoever, RNA or DNA, I always read the template 3 to 5. Okay, so here I'm reading it orange and then yellow. So it's making the 
the new strand of RNA. And apparently the last base that was put on was green, which pairs with orange, whatever those might be. And there's a free three prime hydroxy again. So the three prime hydroxy then attacks the alpha or first phosphate of the incoming nucleoside triphosphate. And that's the one with the purple base. This is identical to the chemistry from DNA. Okay, so the three prime OH here attacks the phosphate. The latter two phosphates, the beta and gamma phosphate, leave as pyrophosphate, which are subsequently hydrolyzed to orthophosphates. Okay, and now our new base is attached by its three to five phosphodiester bond. Okay, and it, now it has a free three prime OH and it can attack the next one to come in, whatever match for the next base. The difference here between DNA synthesis and RNA synthesis is you notice this could have started from scratch. I didn't need a base to start. I didn't need to build onto one. I could just plop the first base down and then build onto it. DNA polymerase could not do that, but RNA polymerase can. The other major difference here is the presence of that OH, of course, and it does nothing. It does not get in the way. It does not take part in the chemistry. So DNA synthesis is nearly identical to RNA synthesis, except that RNA synthesis doesn't require that primer. Okay. So how do we get it started? Well, let's look at our, our DNA, our, sorry, our RNA polymerase machine, right? What components does it have? Is it just one protein? So it has many parts. So if you look at our table at the bottom, we've got several parts of this thing. And we label subunits of proteins just by Greek letters. We call them alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so forth. So we're going to label one of these subunits alpha, and it happens to be the gene RPOA, which stands for RNA polymerase A subunit for alpha. And it has a mass of 37 kilodaltons, and if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's okay, but that's your average size protein. And then the beta subunit is clearly much bigger, roughly four to five times larger. And then there's a beta prime subunit, which is evolutionarily a copy of the beta subunit, but it's slightly different. So there's a beta and a beta prime subunit. And then we have multiple smaller, not as small as alpha, but smaller sigma subunits. They're called sigma 70 because they have a mass of 70 kilodons. It doesn't mean there's 70 of them there. So we have several of these put together, a couple of alphas, a beta, a beta prime, and then one or more sigmas come together to make this functional enzyme. So let's say you're assembling this thing and you grab these parts off the shelf. You grab an alpha, you grab another alpha, and you throw a beta prime on it. It's not yet complete. It's like you're building a car, but you left off all the parts. You only have is your steering wheel and tires, right? It's not going to make a functional car yet. So until I assemble all these parts, it is not yet functional. So we call those incomplete assemblies apoenzymes, right? Such as alpha, alpha, and beta prime, or a beta and an alpha, or a beta prime and a sigma, and that's the only thing present. Until I get two alphas, a beta, a beta prime, and one or more sigmas, it is not yet complete. Okay, so I call all those complexes that are not yet functional apoenzymes. Once all the parts are there, two alphas, a beta, a beta prime, and at least one sigma, usually two, but could be any number really, we call it a holoenzyme. It is now functional and it can do RNA synthesis. Okay. I posted an article about the sigma subunit for you on D2L, and you might want to browse through it. It's not very long, but it should help this functionality make more sense. Okay, So we have two alphas, a beta, a beta prime, and one or more sigmas assembled together. This thing is functional. It's ready to go, and it starts synthesizing RNA. At some point, the sigma subunits, not soon after it started, or sorry, not long after it started, they fall off. Right? The sigma subunits will come off. And I like to think of this as an analogy. We're building a, a bicycle. We have all these parts, two alphas, a beta, a beta prime, one or more sigmas. And once it gets started, once it gets rolling, the sigma subunits, being your training wheels, fall off. It's still a functional bike. So in this case, it's still a functional RNA polymerase. We don't call it an apoenzyme anymore. It's still functional. But if it were to happen to fall off the DNA, it can't get started again. Just like you when you were learning how to ride that bike without the training wheels. Well, I don't know about you, but me. I fell down the first time. It was hard to get going again without putting the training wheels back on or your, your parents holding it up for you, which is effectively the same thing. 
So once it gets started and the training wheels or Sigma subunits fall off, yes, it can continue. But if it were to come off of the DNA, it can't start again without putting those training wheels back on, at least briefly. And so that's my little analogy for this thing. So here's how this initiation works. We assemble it. We've got our couple of alphas, a beta, beta prime, and a couple of sigmas. It's fully assembled. It's ready to start. But where do we start? We have a long piece of DNA there. How do we know where to start making our RNA? What well, someone has to tell us. Now, this doesn't mean it needs help doing the chemistry. It needs help finding the starting line. That's all it needs. So we call these promoter sites. So they're generally just upstream of where we want to start transcription, and they have a specific sequence. So in prokaryotes, if you look at the bottom, there's generally two sites. One's about 35 bases upstream of where we want to start, and one's about 10 bases upstream. And the 10 bases upstream one's the famous one. It's called the TATA box or PRIBNO box, and it has that generic sequence of TATA. And it often has an A or T or a couple of A's after it, but it has that TATA -T -A for the most part. So there must exist a protein that recognizes TATA. -T -A. Well, on the other strand of the DNA, remember it's still double-stranded at this point, what would it read? So in the 5 to 3 direction, here it reads TATA. -T -A. On the other strand, in the 5 to 3 direction, it would also read TATA. -T -A. Remember, the other strand's going in the opposite direction. So if you were to write it underneath, you would see it reads A-T-A-T, -T, written 3 to 5, but 5 to 3, it's T-A-T-A. -T -A, right? And that's convenient that they read the same in both directions on each strand. This protein is looking for that palindromic sequence. And remember, a palindrome reads the same on 5 to 3 on each strand. So it's looking for that T-A-T-A. -T -A. a protein finds it, it sits down on it, and it binds tightly. What the RNA polymerase then does, it recognizes the protein sitting there. This is analogous to DNA A's role. Remember, DNA A was to find that origin of replication, and then the other molecules like the helicase would come along and recognize it and say, we're gonna start here. This is what's happening with just fewer players. Our protein, which we're gonna name in a second, is recognizes the TATA sequence, sits down on it, Right? And then says, hey, polymerase, I found the spot. Come start here. Okay? So in eukaryotes, that TATA -T -A still exists. But since the polymerase is bigger, right, it tends to be a little farther back from where it starts because it's a bigger machine. Where it starts and reaches down is a little farther away. It's about 25 bases. Okay? So here's how this machinery is put together. If you look at the diagram on the right, the teal bluish color thing is the bulk of that RNA polymerase. So that would be your pair of alpha subunits, the beta and the beta prime. And then the two sigma subunits are shown in orange. Right? There's a segment of DNA laid across it there. And the, the DNA is written left to right, 5 prime to 3 prime on the coding strand. So the non-coding or template strand is going 3 to 5 left to right. And that's the darker green one. And what we're looking at is where this contacts the RNA polymerase. So some protein, which is not shown in this picture, has recognized these minus 10 and minus 35 elements. It's a protein we'll get to in a second. It told the RNA polymerase to bind here. So it does. And when it binds here, it has to find itself the exact spot to start. One base left or right is wrong. So we need to find the exact spot to start. And that's what our sigma subunits are doing. What they're actually doing is making the RNA polymerase, and this might seem counterintuitive at first, but they're making it bind less tightly. So if the sigma subunits were not there, this RNA polymerase would bind tightly. And you would think, why would it bind tightly? Well, this is a machine that has to go down this template and preferably not fall off. So of course it binds tightly to any stretch of DNA, no matter the sequence, because it has to do that as it's going down the template it's reading and not fall off. So the site where it needs to start must bind even more tightly. That's where our sigma, subunits come, sigma subunits come in. They initially make it bind weakly or decrease the affinity so it can scan along this little region. Maybe the little protein that told us where to start might have been off a little base here and there. So it scans left and right a little bit until it finds a tighter binding spot. Once it does, it clamps down very tightly. But if the sigma subunits were not there, 
wherever it bound, it would just stick and we wouldn't necessarily get in the right spot. So think of them as a just a loosening tool to help you scan locally and find that right spot. Okay, so now we're ready to start. Right, so what happens is this pair of alphas and beta, beta prime, and one or more sigmas have found the right spot. If you look at this diagram on the right, that's called the promoter region. They've been told to bind here, it binds, and it starts replication, or sorry, it starts transcription. So it pulls the strands apart, no helicase needed. It can do it on its own. It pulls the DNA strands apart. You notice it's reading the template strand and ignoring the blue coding strand. It actually goes around the outside of the protein. It doesn't interact at all. And it's making the piece of RNA from scratch. It did not need a primer. After it puts on about eight or 10 nucleotides, the sigma subunits are having a, is causing a problem now. So if you remember, their goal was to make it bind less tightly. So they do until it finds the start site, clamps down tightly at that start site. And now as we're pulling away from the starting station, away from the starting line there, the sigma subunits again are trying to make it stay there or if we move it, bind less tightly again. Neither of those are favorable now. So we kick off the sigma subunits, and now it clamps down on the template strand more tightly without the sigma present. And so initially it's to help you find the starting line, and then the training wheels come off and we can pedal along better without those getting in our way. And so it continues, and we're making RNA, reading the template. As we're reading this template, you notice the red template strand goes through the enzyme. I have a better picture for you in a second and the blue one goes around the outside. Once we're done reading the template and we make our piece of RNA, unlike the DNA replication, we have to put these strands back together because they're not forming two separate DNA molecules now. We only temporarily read this thing as a template. We're not separating it permanently. So behind the interaction, behind where the replication or where the transcription is taking place, we need to put the DNA strands, the two strands, the template and the coding back together. So in the backside of RNA polymerase, it rewinds them. It puts them back together. So it doesn't need help with the helicase to do that as well. So again, it's all in one machine. It just needs to be told where to start. Okay, okay so here's, here's the, the whole process in one slide. So if we start on the bottom with that picture, it's showing our growing chain. Uh, maybe this picture makes sense to some, and. I kind of don't like it that much, but it helps some people, so I left it in. And we have a, a molecule in red there. X is whatever the base X is. It could be any base. It doesn't matter. It's A, C, G, or U, right? So it's one of our, our raw materials, our, our ribo RNA building raw materials, and whatever X might be one of the bases. And you notice it's got all three phosphates, like all of them do. And I come in, and whatever the template tells me to do, I put in the next base. So across from the template is a Y. Whatever Y binds to, this is what we should be putting in next. I'm not saying X binds to Y. I'm saying Y is the next base that gets put in. It's across from the appropriate base. I do it just like DNA. I attack it with the 3' prime hydroxy. I lose the pyrophosphate. You see that leaving pyrophosphate, subsequently degraded by hydrolysis and I end up with one phosphate left between X and Y. And then across from there, I put in whatever binds to the next template base, in this case it's Z, and we continue, keep putting bases in. When I'm done with this whole process, unlike DNA, at the very beginning, I still have a triphosphate. The very first base, since I started from scratch, was never touched. It has three phosphates. Why doesn't DNA have that? Let's think about how DNA was made. In order for DNA to be made, we first have to put down a little primer made of RNA, and then RNA polymerase, the primase, got out of the way. DNA polymerase took over and said, I can take it from here, and starts adding on. Well, eventually, we have to come back and remove the little RNA primer, and our exonuclease function can do that. Our 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease function comes back and removes the little RNA primer. But when it finishes removing the RNA part, the first base of the new DNA will only have one phosphate because it was connected by a single phosphate. That's opposed to this case where we're making RNA, there is no primer needed, so the first base still has all three phosphates. And that's the difference between nascent or newly born DNA and RNA. The RNA will always have a triphosphate, the DNA will only be a monophosphate. 
Right, so that's shown at the top here. If you want to look at it in more detail, the first base we put in, which is generally a purine, usually A, but often G, is put on, and it doesn't lose any phosphates. You didn't attach it to anything. You just put it across from the template. And then, of course, the next base, whatever it might be, could be anything. We put it on, that's the one in black, and we end up with a monophosphate between them, right? And we continue doing this down the line with phosphates in between the sugars. But there will be three phosphates on the five prime end. Okay. Looking at the picture below, it's kind of taking all that into consideration in this diagram. And if you want to label these things, and I know I did it for you, but you can imagine having no labels on here, which we'll do on the next slide. We have a blue strand, a green strand, and a red strand. The blue and red strands here are clearly the DNA we're starting with that's going to act as our source material. One strand is the coding strand, which is not involved in the process. That's the blue one. And even if I didn't label it coding strand, you could have picked that out by the two reasons. One, it's not pairing with the new RNA. The red one is. So that must be the template strand. Therefore, the blue is the coding strand. And also the direction. If you look at the blue one from left to right, it reads 5 prime to 3 prime. That's the same direction as the polymerase is moving. It can't be moving along its template that way. That's the way it makes the new RNA. Also, left to right is 5 to 3. So the, the blue strand must be our coding strand. The red one, left to right, is 3 to 5. That's the direction the polymerase is moving. That's the one I'm reading. That's the template. It's also obvious that it's a template because it's pairing with the new RNA as it's being made. It's being it's telling it what to put in next. And you see what's called the elongation site, the three prime end of the RNA as it's being assembled is the free OH ready to attack the next new piece. On the five prime end of the RNA in green is also our three phosphates as you see at the picture at the top. So what drives this whole reaction forward? Well, we have a new base put on and every time it's put on, we release the latter two, the gamma and beta phosphates and they are subsequently hydrolyzed by an enzyme called pyrophosphatase. It degrades pyrophosphate into two orthophosphates. Again, RNA polymerase is doing all of this on its own. It's lost its training wheels, it's moving along, and it goes very fast. It's unwinding the DNA ahead of itself, threading the template strand through itself. The coding strand goes around the outside. And then on the back side of it, it's twisting them back together or rewinding them. And here's a better picture of that in more realistic fashion. And there's a video link there you can click if you want to watch it in motion. But if I, I gave you this picture, and much like the last one, I asked you, which of these is which strand? And I didn't label it. Well, I color-coded it just like the last one. RNA is our new piece, and you can see it's being made in the center one base at a time and coming out the back of the molecule through a little exit tunnel. The red strand is the one going through there, pairing with the RNA, so it must be the template. And you see the blue coding strand doesn't go anywhere near the RNA. It goes around the outside of the protein. So if I asked to ask you which end of each of these is 5' prime and 3', prime, you could label all six ends. Right? So the RNA strand, you could label the 5' prime end as the part on the top left because it's already been made. The three prime end is where all the synthesis is happening. That's in the middle of the protein there where it's pointing to the magnesium. The blue strand would have its five prime end either at the top or on the right. Let's figure it out. That's the coding strand. So it must appear in the same orientation as the RNA. So the top blue is the five prime and the right of the blue is the three prime. The template strand is the opposite of the RNA being made. So the template strand, the red at the top would be the three prime side and the template strand on the right would be the five prime side right the red one because that's the direction it's moving so make sure you can do that pair this up with the previous slide so you know which direction is which and keep in mind i may not give you this exact figure but you can see what's pairing with what and you can figure out which end is which okay. so it's moving along and it does this about 50 correct nucleotides per second and there's no way you can type that fast and this doesn't mean that the correct nucleotide always fits in the active site 50 times per second. You get many, many, many more incorrect associations because there's only one out of four is correct. So if the next base it's requiring, on, according to the template strand, there's an A on the template strand. I need to put in a U across from it. Well, what if a 
a G shows up, right? A GTP shows up. It's not going to work. It doesn't fit in the active site and it's rejected. But that takes time. And then another G shows up. And then an A shows up. And then a C. And then another A. And we finally get a U, right? So there's a lot of mismatches there that get rejected and not put in. But it still puts in 50 correctly per second. So there's many, many times that that are shuffling in and out of there per second. So does it ever make a mistake? Of course it does. It makes far more mistakes than the DNA polymerase does. But why is that tolerated? Well, if I'm making this little piece of RNA and it's a mistake, I could always degrade it and make a correct one. Yes, it was expensive, but it didn't cause any permanent damage. When you're copying the DNA and you make the two copies, if a mistake gets by, they're very rare, but if a mistake is made, then that's a permanent mutation. It's now the new norm for that daughter cell. Right? It may not be compatible with life, that's true, or it may be permanently changed and not have any effect at all. Right? So those can't be corrected. So RNA mistakes are more tolerated because we can always make a new one. What's the upside of making more mistakes? I can go a lot faster. Right? If I don't check my work as often, then I can proceed and make the RNA much faster than I can make DNA. Okay. So eventually we have to stop. All right? We can't keep doing this forever. So we're going to keep going along the DNA, reading it, until we're told to stop. And here's a major mistake I always get from students. It does not involve a stop codon. Stop codons, and codons in general, are involved in translation of this message, which we'll do later. How do we stop making the RNA? It has absolutely nothing to do with stop codons. Okay? Those are encoded in the message, which we'll use later. So they're far, we're far beyond any stop codon that's been made into the RNA at this point. So farther past that in the untranslated region, we have two ways of stopping. One's called row-dependent, and one's called row-independent. So let's do the row dependent first, because that one's very simple to think about. So think back to our drawing again. We have, and I'll actually go back to it for you so you can see it. We have this DNA threading through here, the template strand. We have the coding strand in blue going around the outside, and we're making RNA as it threads through at 50 nucleotides a second, which is very fast. How do we know when to stop? Well, if we run out of DNA, we're certainly going to stop, but that's generally not the case. I mean, we've got millions of bases of DNA, and we don't want to make the RNA that long. Right? We only want to go for a few thousand bases or so. So what happens is, as the RNA is coming out the backside, some protein may recognize that sequence of RNA. So a short sequence of RNA may get recognized by a particular protein. We'll call that protein the row protein. And that's this little symbol at the top. So this protein recognizes a specific sequence of RNA not shown in the picture here. And what it does is once it binds to it, it starts climbing the ladder. So it starts moving along the RNA towards the RNA's three prime end, and it uses ATP to do this, to power it. So it's a little, little ladder climbing protein, and it climbs along the single-stranded RNA until it reaches this point right here. Right? So it's coming along the RNA, reaches where the RNA is coming out of the back of the polymerase, this protein is very small, right? Part of it goes right through this window, and it acts as a helicase, and it rips the RNA right, away from the template strand. So it just pulls the red and green strands apart. So clearly this rho protein has to travel faster than 50 nucleotides per second as it's climbing the ladder, or it'll never catch the polymerase. So it moves very fast, catches the polymerase, and essentially unzips the RNA from and since this thing doesn't have its training wheels anymore, it can't just hop back on and continue. So that's the end of our message, or the end of that particular piece of RNA. It doesn't have to be mRNA. And so row dependence is very simple. A small row protein latches onto the growing strand, climbs the ladder really fast, and bowls its way into the RNA polymerase, acting as a helicase, separating the DNA template strand from the new RNA strand, and it can't continue. The row independent is a little more subtle how it works. So going back to our picture again, we don't have any molecule catching up to this, but as the RNA is coming out the back side of this, it's perfectly reasonable to think that the RNA could interact with itself. Right? It can fold on itself and make these little stem loops. So that's what it does, and it happens all along the stretch. So the RNA can fold on itself all the time. It makes it more stable. 
but it'll only do it in certain ones where the stem base pair is well and the loop is not terribly large or too small. And some have really large loops, some have smaller ones, but sometimes you'll form something like this, this little hairpin. Right? And what matters most about this hairpin, as you told me a few lectures ago, it's not so much the sequence, although the sequence does in effect determine the structure, but it has to be the right length for the stem and the right size of the loop. So in this case, we have a certain size stem and certain radius loop, and that thing forms and reaches over somewhere on the polymerase. We don't exactly know where or how this works yet because it's very fast, but this folded up RNA will reach over to the polymerase and you can think of it as hitting the eject button, right? So it reaches over and hits it and the entire thing comes apart. All the alpha subunits and beta and beta prime subunits just completely dissociate. It's like it has an ejector seat for the thing. So it reaches over, hits the button, and the whole complex falls apart. Well, that's clearly going to terminate transcription. The problem is, once this little RNA loop forms, a second later, it's going to be 50 nucleotides down the chain. So this has to form and be able to reach the eject button quickly. So how do we make sure that happens? So immediately after this loop is made, there's a series of U's that need to be put on. How do we know they're going to be used? Because in the template strand, it's a series of A's. So on the template strand, there's a series of A's in a row, maybe four, five, six, seven in a row. And that means this RNA polymerase needs to get a uracil stuck in there many times in a row. And of the four available bases, uracil is the least abundant, right? Between the U's, C's, G's, and A's, the U is the least abundant in the cell. So to put on a series of U's in a row kind of makes the RNA polymerase stall a little bit, right? It, it stutters or slows down, giving this just enough time, this doesn't take long, we're talking microseconds, just enough time to reach over and hit the eject button. But if the U's are not there, it still forms the stem loop, but it's so far away that it can't interact anymore. So without the U's, we don't stop. So what the cell will have is a stem loop followed by this series of U's, and we'll do several of these in a row. You know, stem loop, followed by U's, another stem loop, followed by U's, another stem loop, followed by U's. It's like a, a plane landing on an aircraft carrier, right? If you don't catch one wire, you're going to catch the next one. So it's, a, it's an insurance policy. If we don't stop at the first stem loop, we're going to get stopped at the third or fourth one. It's unlikely to pass that many without it happening. Okay? This is not a stop codon. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk about those later. This is a stop signal, if you want to call it that. So know the difference between row-dependent, the little ladder-climbing protein that acts as a helicase, and row-independent, which is a RNA molecule as it's being made, terminating its own transcription. The next four slides are going to talk about the LAC operon, which I'm not going to cover in our lecture here in detail. This is more important for those in lab. And I wanted to put the slides in here so you can reference it in case you wanted to know about it. So I'll leave these for you to look at on your own. It controls the production of genes under the control of some regulator, which we'll get to when we get started our next lecture in more detail.